Morning guys, GTP Angler Jason Reese here. Thanks for tuning in to Googling the Pro Offshore Angler. Today is going to be a very different kind of a video day. Um, kind of like I just recently posted the uh, 2023 um, highlights from last year, showing a lot of the great fish that we caught out here last year and some of the fun times. Uh, today's video is going to be like the flip side of that. It's going to be the lessons learned from last year. And yes, there was some lessons learned from success. Unfortunately, failure tends to be my best teacher. So uh, what I'm going to kind of share with you guys today is it's going to be a lot, a lot of talking is a lot of um, the things that I learned last year that are going to make me a better angler uh, this year. So I'm going to start with a bit of a tragic story. So coming back from the Keys last year, which that video is out there, we got up early. We um, came out to do uh, just some early morning trolling. So we got up 4 a.m. We were out before sun up caught some sunrise blackfin tuna and shortly after planer rod goes off massive hit and uh, th those of you who chase wahoo like i do know the sound and the run of a wahoo that first run is the best sound that i hear in my entire life so i was pumped i've caught a bunch of 30 pound class wahoo this is you know and around here in south florida we tend to get like a lot of like 15 20 pounders I've been looking for that like 50 plus pounder and I felt like we'd finally get a shot at it. So the line goes off, it's screaming, slowing down, going to the reel, right when we get set up, it's gone. And what I find, this hook, this, this size hook, totally pulled out almost, almost straight. So the kicker was that we had been out fishing for a couple of days and I'd gone through my larger hooks and I had one of these which you, you, can, you can find online. It's a smaller hook, standard swivel, a little, little bit of wire wrapped around and this works for most fish here and a lot of times that'll bring in fine 20 pound wahoo, 30 pound wahoo, but we lost that one. Put the hook straight. So I now carry like 30 extra of these normal hooks and you can find these at some tackle shops. This is a giant Limerick hook, straightened out, huge space here to put a bonita strip and a big ball bearing swivel and this will deal with that big wahoo. And unfortunately I had one of these on the other side of the boat, but I hit the smaller hook, lost that big fish, crushed me, terrible lesson to learn, um, but I did learn from it. So now I only carry a uh, plethora of larger hooks on board so I don't wind up in that position again. Um, that was a tough lesson learned. Um, I'll tell you a few Wahoo things. I guess that's what I've become kind of locally known for. If you listen to a lot of seminars and you watch a lot of YouTube videos on Wahoo fishing, especially here in South Florida, you hear a lot of the guides and I respect the hell out of them, but they'll, they'll tell you that they catch most of them between 120, 150 out to about 200, 250. And I have caught a bunch of wahoo, even in that 120 green water range, less of them like kingfish. But last year, um, I caught a lot of wahoo between three and 400. And that's not an area that a lot of people are out here fishing. And I know that because I'm out here fishing it right now and all the boats I see are shallower than I am. So um, that was a big lesson for me last year. Especially when it's busy and today's a Saturday, so there's a thousand boats up and down here. It's a lot easier to be out here. I can freely troll without worrying about bumping into other people. And I caught a bunch of Wahoo last year um, at those at those depths. Uh, and when the bite is hot, bring enough artificial baits to back you up if you run out of your regular Bonita strips. So I I tend to lean more into Bonita strips than I do Ballyhoo uh, for a number of reasons. One, they pull straighter, longer, and I actually have. Better, better hookups and um, more bites on strips than I do Ballyhoo. Ballyhoo tend to wash out faster for me and wind up being the thing that forces me to troll the slowest in my spread. I can pull planers with strips faster, uh, including having Ballyhoo even on like top, an Islander or whatever. So I go more Bonita strips. I used to bring like 15 thinking that that would be enough. Now I'm out here every day with like 25 and I have artificials as backup. And the artificials do work. I'm gonna do some videos this year on the different types of artificial bonita strips versus regular ones, and we'll just kind of test and see um, how the different hookup ratios work and see see which ones are uh, are better. Um, when you are using bonita strips, let me show you one thing here. Here's two different size bonita strips that you might see in your local bait shop. So people think bigger strips catch bigger fish. Some people, and they get a lot bigger than this. These are like mid-sized ones here. These are smaller ones here. 
So you, you'll find these, plus they'll be like down to down to here sometimes. People will say, oh, those are from a big wahoo, or I'm gonna fish them in the Bahamas. Like, cool. What I've experienced is these small ones have a much higher hookup ratio. And the reason is that once you hook this strip up, you have all of that extra dangling meat behind that hook. So if you look at it this way, that is half of the strip hanging out there behind behind the hook. And Wahoo, they strike at the propulsion of a fish. So they hit the tail, circle back, and consume that fish. So if half of that strip is sticking out, and I've run a whole bunch of these, but I don't have shorter ones, they get hit, they get short strikes, the planer trips, you can come up, half your strip is gone, hook is untouched. So I have found that the smaller bonita strips get me a higher hookup ratio. I'm not gonna say more bites, I'm gonna say a higher hookup ratio. So that was that, that's a good pro tip. Six months last year, maybe maybe five months, making my own strips, so I caught a lot of bonita last year. And uh, what I learned is that, yes, I can cut them, I can bevel the edges, and I can get them looking pretty great. Like, as good as you can buy in the store, and I deploy them, and I caught a bunch of fish, and for a while I was proud. But I realized that if I'm not getting a lot of bites and they're sitting out there longer getting pulled behind the boat, they weren't lasting as long as the ones you buy that the commercial guys do. And it's because those are treated. So they're using like salt, baking soda, whatever, and they're toughening up those strips so they hang on the hook longer. And um, you can pull them behind the boat for you know two hours without them like washing out. And mine are going like 45 minutes to an hour and a half and they're gone. So. Um, I have gone back to buying Bonita strips uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that like I'm lazy when it comes to it. Like I, I'm not fast at cutting Bonita strips. I'll be out there after the day is over with a headlamp with 25 Bonita out there trying to cut strips, and the night's over. I just want to go home and like eat my fish. So as good as I got at it, which I'm still not an expert, they're not as good as the ones that I can buy off buy out of the freezer at the marina or at your local tackle shop. So. Uh, I've gone back to buying them, but if you do make your own, treat them and they will last longer. Frayed leaders are a thing that I'm sure all of you guys watch out for. And nine times out of ten, if I see a frayed leader, I'm, I'm cutting it and redoing it. And um, I'm checking after I catch a fish for the leader to make sure it's not frayed. But I'll share with you twice uh, last year. Uh, and mostly by myself, I, I noticed that with frayed leader I was in a pinch redeployed it. I mean, it was like barely nicked. Next hit, lure gone. Two months later, same thing. Quick little pull of the drag, lure gone. So check your leaders. If they're afraid, replace them. I gambled twice on it and I lost both times. The DTX minnows, I get a lot of questions about. So I'll share that I, I believe in those lures. I started pulling them last year and I pulled them for a couple of months uh, with no success. Like one missed hookup, but almost no success. And then without doing anything different, uh, one day I started getting bites, and then again, and again, and again, and again. And here, if they're, if for me, they're a wahoo and a kingfish bait. And where I think they work is, let's say that you, one of your planer rods gets a full a full cutoff, bridle and everything, or some fish hits the, hits the planer itself, and you lose all your leader and everything, and you're in a pinch. Have that DTX, uh, ready to go, throw it on and fish it along with your other planer rod while you're um, setting up a new 100 foot leader for the other planer rod, however you want to do it. They're, they're good to put on in a pinch when you need them. And they're also good to have on in general. So this is a big enough boat that I can run two planers by myself without without uh, without tangling them. I'm not making like super sharp turns. But when I'm on a smaller boat, a lot of times, or just the fishing that I don't feel as confident in, I'll do one planer and one DTX minnow. So I've got two deeper baits without as much risk of tangling as you would with a traditional like double planer setup. So there's a good time to use those then. Um, I started using the smaller DTX minnows at first, and the smaller ones have uh, two treble hooks, and I had great hookup ratios on those. If you watch the videos from last year, you'll see that I catch a number of wahoo with those lures. I bumped up and I bought some of the 200 and 220 DTX minnows and those do not have treble hooks. Those have just, you know, a big a big J hook hanging off each side and I got some massive bites on those and no hookup. So Wahoo grabs it, 
screaming line for a minute, and then it's gone, and you bring it in. It's just nothing. You, you sometimes even see the bite marks where it hit the DTX right in the middle, but neither of those hooks caught it. So my opinion is that the DTX minnows, the bigger ones, they definitely do work, but they have a lower hookup ratio than the smaller ones that have the treble hooks. But the trade-off is that sometimes, this happened to me last year, the Wahoo will bite off the entire lure. Because the lure is only this big, Wahoo comes and smashes it and bites it off the leader and the whole thing is gone. So you lose the fish but you also feel bad because the chance that fish is going to die with a treble hook in it they just consume. So um, I'm somewhere in between now depending on the day where I'll pull a big DTX or a bit of a smaller one with the, with the double treble hooks. And they got the new heavy duty ones out now. And the other concern people hit me up about is they don't last, you know. They um, they catch one or two fish and they go out of tune or they get water in them. And I also experienced that. Uh, I, you catch a nice wahoo, you gaff it, bring it in the boat. And even if you're careful with the lure, the fish hits the boat, flips over and just starts flipping around and smashing its head against the deck. Then you put the lure back out that just caught a fish, we're gonna go get another one and it won't pull straight. It comes up and pop, pops out of the water. So, you feel like the lure is trash. These lures are 30 to 50 bucks each. That's a expensive lure for it to only to catch one fish sometimes. But here's what I learned. Nomad will take back those minnows and all you gotta do is show them, show them your receipt, show them the lure. They'll let you pick from whatever color you want that they have available and they'll ship it. it comes from Australia, so it, it takes them a little bit of time, but uh, they will replace all the lures that you bust out here. So show them your, show them your receipt, save your receipt when you're buying those lures and um, you'll get replacement. So my summary of that is there's a time and a place to use those DTX minnows and they do work. I also run the Nomad um, Mad Max. I remember one this morning. Uh, I do run those on, on, um, on wire and those are also effective, but I feel like not as effective as the DTX minnows are. They, they just don't dive as deep. But if you already have two deep baits, uh, a Mad Mac is a good one to deploy off one of your outriggers or further back past your planers or your um, bigger deep, your bigger deep lift lures, and that way you can have you know three or four uh, deeper deeper baits. Wahoo will occasionally hit the surface baits. If you see on my videos last year, you'll see that uh, while you did come up, even nailing like a small tuna feather. So don't sleep on the fact that if you're out in Wahoo territory and they're biting, you might catch one on anything in the spring. And when you are a planer fishing, um, especially when you are fishing by yourself, keep at least one yo-yo with everything from your hook, seaweed, squid, all your baits, to your actual bridle. I've got a uh, 100 feet on here. I always have one or two of these ready to go because you will get bite-offs, you will have a, maybe you a tangle or something where you need access deploy a quick leader where you're not throwing out a hundred feet you know of um, line and wasting wasting uh, precious trolling time so keep a couple of yo-yos on board that are already set up and ready to go um, speaking of leader for uh, for planers I um, I started I started fishing in 2022 with uh, I was doing 120 pound uh, leaders and slowly over the course of six months I brought it down to 60 and I was running 60 pound uh, leader most of the year last year, but I did have a couple of couple of break offs. And you could say like, well, it's because your drag was too tight. And and I would agree with that. I think you can catch fish out here on, on 60 pound, but I didn't see a big bite difference between 80 pound and 60 pound. So I, I went back to 80 pounds. So now I'm back to running um, 80 pound leaders out here. And I, I feel like that's a good, a good balance of strength um, without being uh, ridiculously thick. I mostly run a five line spread out here, whether by myself or with somebody else. And um, those of you that watch my channel uh, for the last year, you probably noticed that I that I bumped up the, the reels. So I did uh, I did move my planer rods to uh, to 50 wides, Shimano Tiagras, and that's really in preparation for that 60 pound Wahoo that I've been looking for. Um, and I bump everything else in the spread up to um, Abbott 30 wides. And that's helpful to get the fish to the boat faster. Like, uh, we don't have as big of a shark problem out of Hillsborough that I, that I hear about in like Jupiter and the Bahamas, but we do occasionally get sharks and it's good to get the fish to the boat. And even fish you plan to release, you can get them in faster without totally exhausting them. Their chances of survival are higher. So, um, I don't know. It's been it's been a good change since bumping up the uh, the reels and like 
some would argue it's a little bit less sporty in some cases, but I think the, I think the trade-offs are worth it. I've done a number of tutorials on the, the inline painter trolling because that's the one that I keep getting more requests about. They want to, everyone wants to see more detail about it, doing this inline versus hand lining them in. Um, so there's a whole bunch of tutorials from last year's videos. Go look up one of the inline bridle ones. And a couple of things to share. Um, when you're tying the bridle on, so when you're going braid to that bridle, that is a massive point of tension, obviously. You got a number eight planer pulling it, pulling your, pulling your bait down and suddenly a fish smashes it. So that knot has got to be good. And I have lost a couple. So what I've gone to is a 10 wrap uni knot. And since moving to that knot and doing full 10 wraps, I have not had that knot uh, slip and lose my rig. So that was a hard lesson learned. I lost two of those due to that knot slipping with previous, with, uh, previous knots. Um, if you're planer won't set it's usually one of a couple things well hopefully the fish on it that's why it won't set and that does happen sometimes you're letting the bait out and while you're putting the planer on you get distracted and a fish grabs the bait and puts the planer in the water and it won't it won't set because there's a fish on it which is awesome rare but awesome um, but usually what happens is that it, maybe a you're not you're not going fast enough or you're going too fast Sometimes those bridles that you buy, if you buy pre-made uh, plater bridles, they aren't long enough for that to set properly. So make sure that the bridle is long enough for that planer to set. Other thing that does happen is those planers can get bent. And more than it, the chances of it getting bent while you're using it are less likely than you are to buy it bent off the rack. So that's happened to me where I've come out with a new planer and I go to set it and I can't figure out why it won't set. So I deploy it, I pull some line in, I let it go, wait for that rod to snap over set and it won't happen, the planer won't set. And what's really happening is that the little arm that goes from the weight to the planer plate is bent. And because of that, it won't set properly in the water. So make sure you look for that to see if, um, make sure it's straight. You can bend them straight yourself with the vise if you uh, need to, but more importantly for me, what I do is I just make sure they're straight when I'm buying them off the um, off the rack. And those planers will dive. I've had them bang off of uh, a reef in 50 feet, which that's a hard lesson. You don't want that to happen. You don't want to damage coral down there. Um, but if that does happen, pull that planer up and check it for damage, because chances are you pull that thing nine knots and it hits a rock, it's going to be damaged. So they do dive deep. Check, um, check them to make sure they're straight and they are running true for you. I have done a lot of uh, fishing with teasers this year, so I get a lot of questions on that. Um, my friend Brett introduced me to running a boon bird off the shotgun, and that's been great for two reasons. One is that some days it's the only place that we get bites. Uh, my friend Rich adopted it. He's calling it the, uh, the JR Skunk Buster after me, and it will save your day sometimes. You're having a slow bite day, and you get a couple blackfin tuna, so that's those work. The secondary purpose it serves it's straight out behind you, I've got half the school out there on a day where there's boats everywhere. Other boaters can visually see where my last line is. So before I was running that teaser on a busy day out here in South Florida, where we have a lot of uh, pressure on our fishery, people will run over that shotgun. They don't expect that I've got half a 30 wide spool dumped out there, pulling that last bait way behind. And I do that because a lot of those boat shy fish will skip everything close to the boat and just pick up that very last bait running out there in clean water. So having the visual of this bird bouncing on top shows other boaters where my last bait is. And since I've gone to it, nobody has cut me off, which is nice. So almost we'll the entire year last year of no, no cutoffs. And, that, and those birds bouncing on the water do draw fish attention. So th th those do work. The others that I'll tell you about, and I did an episode last year on them called Out Rovers, is they're the same bird teaser, but they're designed and molded to go to the port or starboard side. And here's, here's why that's great. One is, now you have a teaser out there drawing fish attention, sure, but if you put them on your, let's say for me I went off my outrigger, it will go even further away from the boat and pull my bait in that nice clean water and if you don't have outriggers, or you're on a day where you don't want to put your outriggers up because it's rough and you're by yourself, then 
those those out rovers will pull your baits away from the boat, allowing you to run more baits with less chance of a uh, tangle. When I'm talking about those days that I'm not using outriggers, it can be a day that I'm out here by myself, but it's just it's too rough and dangerous for me to be standing on the gunnel and messing around with um, with outriggers. And on those days, uh, I will just go to a, a four line spread where I'll still run like two planers or a planer and a DTX minnow, sort of close to the boat, and then I'll run the shotgun way out and then like a feather in between the planer and the um, and the shotgun just to keep everything staggered so there's not, not a risk of, of tangles. And although I feel like my odds are better fishing with five to seven lines and using outriggers, I don't feel like it's a uh, a big hit to my fishing day where I'm like, maybe I'll get 20% less activity or whatever, but still worth going just with a little less times of weather and a little less, a little less risk going on. And if you are having issues with your outriggers or honestly like any other equipment in your boat, don't get caught up in messing around. If it's not critical, do not mess around with it in your first like hour or two of your, of your day. For those of us who get up at 4am, come out here and capitalize on, on the first light bite, that's not the time to fix an outrigger or mess around with some non-essential equipment. Like, maximize that first light bite and deal with the equipment stuff later on when the bite turns off or it's middle of the day hot or you're gonna bottom fish and you're anchored up and you throw out some lines and mess with it then. So don't waste the best time of your day fishing messing around with equipment. Don't get stuck trolling in the same area where you've caught fish before um, when they're not biting that particular day. So for me, I've, I've got a couple spots where I've had success and I want to go fish those same spots over and over again. Um, and I've caught myself circling back through and running figure eights through and it wasn't productive, but I just I had this history of catching fish there, so I wanted to do it again. If it's not productive in 30 minutes, whether you are trolling or you're bottom fishing, it, go somewhere else. Like, it's not happening. The fish and conditions change every single day. Go somewhere else, do something different. Because it's worked once or in the past does not mean it's gonna to work today and it could be a slow day. Or the fish could be somewhere else. It's worth exploring other areas. The one thing people always ask me is like, what are the best odds to come out here and catch Wahoo in South Florida? That's, the, that's like the most common question I get for somebody who's traveling down here, whether it's someone looking for a charter or somebody in my family or a friend, they want to come out, they want their best shot at a Wahoo. When do I come? Uh, I know people think that right now, this is February, that like winter's a good time, and like two weeks ago, people were killing it out here, so it definitely can be. I've had better luck uh, during the spring. Um, I go, my best days are like two days in front of the full moon on an outgoing tide. But you can put all those things together. That's been my best uh, days for a for Wahoo bite. And I've had others say that they do better after the full moon. And like a week or two ago here, that was the case here in Florida where everybody was going for days after and they were doing pretty good. It's also dependent on, you know, storms before and after and all that stuff. But if, if you had to just pick and choose your day far in advance, I would say come for the spring, Come in front of the full moon when there's going to be an outgoing tide. That's my that's my favorite time to come out here and chase Wahoo. So here's a quick silly story to hopefully have somebody else avoid a, a, an easy issue to avoid. Is I was out trolling last year and it was it was a slower day and I had like three bites and it was like 10 a.m. and um, I go past this weed patch that I found with my, with my binoculars and. I go through it, sure enough, right as I edge around this weed patch, uh, one, of, one of these lines goes off. And this mahi comes flying out of the air and shakes the hook. Oh man, I lost him, he's on a ballyhoo. And I reel it in to check the ballyhoo and find out that on the hook is that little piece of protective rubber that they have. And I've had another another friend on a miss hook up on a new lure that he bought, and it had a clear plastic piece of rubber around around the end, or a clear piece of plastic vinyl around the end. I, I think it was. So my point is, make sure when you're deploying new lures or you bought value or whatever, make sure there's no safety cards on the hooks. Like it's such a stupid thing, but it will it will cost you. I actually now. Uh, I pull everything off before I even go out, like the day before. So I went out filling this morning. Yesterday is when I rigged everything, rigged back up yo-yos, 
got the boat staged and pulled, I have some new lures and I pulled all those protective hooks up because I don't want to think about it while I'm out here. I want to maximize all my fishing time while I'm out here. Um, so I do everything, you know, the day or, or um, days, days, days before. And speaking of those big floating mats of, of seaweed, my, my first year starting to fish in 2022, if I found a big mat of seaweed in the middle of nowhere, out in like 500 to 2,500 feet, or a piece of debris or a log or anything, it held fish. I'd be like, all right, I've got a bunch of, um, bunch of pilchards ready to go, box of squid, maybe a couple of jigs. Bucktail jigs are my favorite out there. And I, I would go out there and catch probably with a dolphin. And it was like magic. You find the debris, here we go. Maybe I would troll by it once or twice and I'd pull the boat up and just pull them out until I was until the box was full or until we hit our limit. And last year, that was almost never the case. So I did a, a little bit of running and gunning and I found some great debris, you know, big floating trees, bamboo, giant logs, uh, Cuban refugee boats. I mean like great debris that previously would have held tons of fish. And I come up on it, it's lifeless, or there are no ma'i. And yes, a couple times last year, there was there was fish there. So I, I'm not saying don't go looking for debris or don't go troll it or, or fish it when you see it. What I'm saying is, is that the tactics that worked for me in 2022 weren't working through the same way in 2023. So I did less running and gunning last year, a little more blind trolling, which ironically wanted being a little more productive. And I stopped pulling the spread in when I would see some great debris. I just, I would assume before that they, that they were there. I'm like, all right, let's go get them, get the spinning rods out, get the pilchards ready. Um, but they weren't there as often uh, last year. So. That's been a change. Hopefully they're gonna be back uh, this year because that's a fun way to fish. We're running out there hauling butt from patch to patch and debris to debris pile. So hopefully that that, uh, that picks back up for us this year. In fact, I actually caught more fish on the, the blue-green water change and rips last year than I did on any kind of debris or off of, or off of any wreck. So constantly be on the lookout for color changes and rips for me last year. That, those held a lot more fish than, than anything else did. Um, other thing I'll say on a semi-funny note is if you wind up with engine troubles and you're kind of just limping in, if you're doing at least, you know, five and a half knots, maybe you're getting eight knots out of one engine on lip mode or something, what well, lines out? I mean, if you're already limping in, you're still burning some fuel, you're out of here, what's, what's the harm in having some lines in? We caught some great fish last year on what would have been, you know, kind of a failed trip because we had an engine problem, so. You can sometimes make a little lemonade out of those lemons. I'm gonna say just a couple of quick things about kite fishing. So uh, for me as, a, as an amateur, that continues to be just a, a super exciting and productive way to catch fish out here in South Florida. But as an amateur, I would say um, it's a little bit humbled uh, in a couple scenarios. Um, one is I had trouble getting a, um, a second kite up and not getting them tangled. So you know, I know you put weights in the corners and they go to different areas. And I think just at an amateur level, getting the boat in the right position, I think I'm still learning and things were a lot simpler, just running one kite. So my recommendation for folks starting off, is keep it simple and run and just run one kite until you're comfortable enough to run, to run two. So we've come out here expecting it to be like 16, 17 mile per hour winds and we've got plenty of wind to fly the kites and the forecast changes even during the day. So bringing a couple of balloons and helium is definitely the way to go if you're gonna kite fish. You're gonna spend $300 or more on live gogs anyways. You might as well have the backup to use them um, in case the, uh, the, wind, the wind forecast changes. We've been adding wire to the lines. Uh, I, mean, like if you, I know that we don't like to use wire when we don't have to, but we've had enough toothy bite offs uh, fishing here between like 100 and 400 feet that kingfish and the wahoo come up and hit that hit that gog and they'll get hooked up, hooked up perfectly they bite through the uh the mono so a small trace of wire there and we did it off the kite and we're also doing it on the flat line and the deep lines that we're doing while we're running the kites because seven times out of ten they've been bitten off the last the last year so i'd rather have less bites now and actually like catch some of those fish that we've that we've lost in the uh, in the past 
for kite fishing, especially if you got a couple of newer guys on board, just clear communication. Just if you don't think it needs to be said, say it anyways. It is challenging to keep the boat in position. You get one or two fish on, you still have lines out there, the kite's still up. Everyone should just be proactively communicating. And the final lesson learned there, if you watch one of our tournament day videos, is we lost like $500 in bait because we bought a bunch of live gogs, we came out trolling for the first part of the morning, and we went to the ship to the kite, looked in the, uh, looked in the uh, live well, and all the gogs were dead. The pump had failed. Even though it was tested the day before, it was still, it still failed. So just periodically check on the live well and maybe add a backup bubbler in there. It won't solve everything, but it might give you a fighting chance. And uh, hopefully you guys can avoid that one. that one. That one was costly. The backup lesson learned is to have a live bay guy uh, on call. So uh, my friend Brett was able to call Boca Live Baits that tournament day and they came out and delivered us three dozen fresh gogs um, outside of the inlet because most tournament days you can't return to the inlet until you're done fishing. So uh, that's that's critical to have that backup. Later. So I wanted to mention a couple of things about coming out with others. Um, I love fishing with anybody who wants to come out here and have fun and I don't mind people coming out here with no offshore experience at all. I'm just for like maximizing the good times out here. Well, you can maximize your success if those people are prepared. So the first thing is that I don't care how many times they've been fishing, make sure they know how to use a conventional trolling rod reel, make sure they understand uh, drag pressure, how to use it, and make sure that you've already dialed it in to as close as you can get without them having to use it. But if they need to use it, they know how to use it. Show them where the clicker is, all of those things. It'll be easier to explain on your way out than it will be while the fish is on the line. Getting people, especially like freshwater folks, not to think about setting the hook so hard, we use a lot of circle hooks or we're trolling the fish hook themselves. And to stop that motion of people pulling up on the fish and dropping the rod tip before they're reeling. And you'll see it often, and especially as I video things now and I watch it back and somebody will pull a fish up and they'll drop the rod tip for a split second and then start reeling in that split second where they released tension on that fish, they lose that fish. It's important to talk to people about that. Don't have them out here just jerking the reel everywhere, just nice and smooth, calm down, the fish is hooked, take your time, we're gonna get it. The last thing I wanted to say about teaching folks coming out is gapping. People will just have never gapped fish in their whole life and they're the person who's holding the gap and now you've bet the day on somebody with no experience. So even if your friend or your family member or whoever says they've done it before, just make sure that they understand some basics. And when I say basics, here's what, here's what I teach people. Let's pretend that my elbow is the head of a fish. And this, this is a fish, not a very big one, I know. The fish is hooked up here. I see so many people reach in front of that leader and try to gap that fish. And what happens is, is if they miss, which does happen a lot, the gap wraps around the leader and it comes down and just pulls the hook right out of that fish's mouth and they successfully release that fish back into the wild. So I tell them, hit it behind the leader, so behind, behind the head. What I tell people to do is take the gap over the top of the fish and rake it towards the boat. So this is the fish again, grab it and rake it towards the boat with the hook down. And once it's down, turn that gap vertical and bring it up. And somebody in one of my videos even caught me catching a fish and leaving the gaff too horizontal, which if you're pulling it up, you can lose that fish off the hook. So gaff it and pull it up vertical, hand over hand, bring it in the boat. Make sure their feet are clear. Tell them the importance of keeping their feet clear. Wahoo and Kingfish teeth will go straight through their amateur shoes and put you guys in a position of having to get off the water immediately, get stitches, I know. I almost lost my thumb to a kingfish uh, over a year ago now. So sharp teeth and flip flops are not, or bare feet are not a, um, a good combination. So make sure your team knows prior to the fish coming into the boat. I've got a few more, few more things to say that are a little more general or random in nature. Uh, one, checklist to leave the dock. Last year we've left everything from the planer rod to kites behind. And it helps to have a checklist that you go through every time from your tackle to your boat to make sure you get off the dock successfully. 
and you aren't freaking out as you leave the inlet that your stuff's an hour behind you and the sun's coming up. Um, we've seen a number of people lose wedding, lose wedding rings out here, uh, including me. I've gone to pure silicone rings, so is everybody else I know. You, you get um, you get fish slime on your hands, you hit it with like, you know, your raw water washed out or a fresh water pump, and that pressured water with uh, fish slime will fire that ring right off of your finger. So go to your like $2 silicone rings. I buy mine in bulk now from Amazon. You lose one, who cares? You, you move on. Go fishing with people, different people, to learn new tactics, which brings me to my next point. Be humble. It, it feels like almost everybody that I talk to about fishing is is some kind of expert. And then you go out with them or they're telling you things. The more they tell you, the more you're like, I don't know. Even if you grew up out here, and I'm, I'm new to this, I'm new to mine. This is, last year was my first full year. This will be my second full year. I'm learning a ton. And there's more, I have so much more to learn on every outing. But the more people that you interact with that are doing things differently, the more you learn. So be humble and be open to to learning new things. And I know that some people are like, hey, you share too much information. You share the depth and the location of these fish that you catch in these videos. That, that's that's too much info. The tactics, too much info. Uh, I'm of the abundance mindset. And I, I believe that these pelagic fish, I mean like, if we don't catch them here, someone catches them somewhere else. Like it's like, it's, you know, more like, more like an us against them, whether it's us of the Carolinas or us of the Bahamas or whatever, like, I want everybody here in South Florida to go out there and slay it. So I'm happy to share information and I hope that a lot of other people are willing to share too. That's how we all learn together. And I want to see all of us maximizing our opportunities out here. Fish with people whose idea of a fun day is not tied to filling the fish box. If somebody comes out on a slow day and they're gonna be whiny or frustrated because the fish aren't biting that day, it makes for a bad day. So come out, have a couple of drinks, enjoy the day. Every day we're out here is a day to be grateful for. It's beautiful out here. People are bundled up in the snow right now and we're, we're out here at a beautiful winter day in South Florida. So embrace these days and bring people out that have a good time. Bring enough beer. I know uh, my friend JJ isn't here to say it. Uh, unless you're tournament fishing for a million dollars, enjoy the day out here with good, with good people. Uh, life is short, be enthusiastic. My, uh, my friend that grew up here at fishing, he's like, every fish you catch, you act like it's your first fish. And you know what, like, I'm not gonna apologize for that. I am so grateful and thankful to be out here. The days I get to do this, every fish is special, every day out is special and memorable, and I love all of it. So be enthusiastic, enjoy it. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up with this. So you guys might know I'm, I'm a Hemingway fan. Most, most anglers are. I drink Pilar rum for, for a reason besides the taste. Uh, he once said that you should try to be as much as possible to be wholly alive with all your might. And for me, out here offshore fishing, I am never more wholly alive than I am when I'm out here on the hunt. So I know some of you guys share that same feeling. I, I enjoy sharing that with you guys. Um, I hope this video was helpful. Uh, please let me know which lessons were actually helpful and please share yours with me, like I said. All humility, I'm out here learning every day. I learn a lot more when you guys share your uh, share your tips and tricks too. So thanks for watching guys. It's gonna be a great year and happy to share it with you.